it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another special edition team up of By Their Fruits and the Remnant Report. We are blessed, as always, to be able to come together and edify the body, spread the gospel. And today we are lucky enough to be doing both. Um, we're going to be talking, we're going to be going to the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we're going to be talking about the mystery that Paul talks about all through his epistles. We see it in Ephesians and Galatians and in Romans. We're going to talk about that mystery, how it was all through the Old Testament, what that mystery was, and when it was actually revealed, and then it's the mystery that we're actually going to get into. But today, my co-host and good friend is Brother John from By Their Fruits. John, I, as always, I am glad to team up with you to tackle a topic from the Bible. How you doing today, brother? Doing well, Pastor Anderson. Glad to be here on with you. Uh, glad we were able to combine our efforts uh, to discuss uh, something that is quite confusing to, sadly, many of our brothers and sisters in Christ who still hold on to the modern um, belief system known as dispensationalism, uh, which is causing major problems uh, with um, <clears throat> end times eschatology if we are truly entering into the end times. Uh, and leading uh, some people astray uh, with a pre-tribulation rapture, uh, uh, for example, um, which is, uh, in my opinion, um, not supported uh, by the Bible or e even uh, the beliefs of the early church. Um, and, um, you know, and I do have, you know, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, and hopefully they would always use the caveat, you know, if I'm wrong. You know, here are the things you need to look out for. Uh, but some pastors don't. They say, well, you know, you don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. So don't worry about that, uh, and which is uh, quite concerning because that is not a pastor who is properly shepherding their flock if that's, you know, uh, Amen. What, what they push. Um, but um, I myself grew up believing in a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, most so uh, Americans do. Uh, I do believe because of the modern... Uh, false uh, theology put forth by uh, Council for National Policy member Tim LaHaye and uh, Jerry B. Jenkins in their series and uh, first novelization and later uh, a multi-movie series, Left Behind, uh, which is very interesting because the Christians and the ones that are, are left behind, supposedly the ones that do become born again, uh, supposedly, yes. allegedly, uh, they're not you know out there preaching the gospel and uh, you know being martyred for the faith. Uh, you know, they, they instead uh, they seem to be very worried that they're trying to survive the entire tribulation, uh, uh, which is a quite interesting uh, take if you actually look at the series as a whole from that perspective that they're going against what we're commanded and what we're going to have to face by our Lord, you know, foretold by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, as well as the Old Testament prophets about us uh, being martyred for the faith in the end times. Um, and, uh, you know, it looks like a lot of it's going to be by beheading. Uh, and, um, 
it's going to be quite interesting because a lot of people are sadly unprepared uh, because of um, pre-rapture teaching uh, and because of dispensationalism uh, teaching, which the dispensationalism is quite modern, at least from what I've seen, of its infiltration into the churches. And it is unpreparing born-again believers, uh, just like uh, post-millennialism and amillennialism and the rise of Christian nationalism is also uh, leading many astray too as well. I think you would agree with that. Yeah, I think that the problem is, and, and Jesus lays this out so very clearly in the Gospels, um, Jesus, of course, is the gate. But after we enter into the kingdom through the gate, which is Christ, there is a narrow way and we must stay on that narrow way. We mm -hmm. can't go to the right or to the left. And each of these um, systematic theologies, um, each system of theology, the doctrines within them, they all hold truth. They have to, for any of them to be believable, they have to hold to some truth. And that's, one of the biggest dangers is the the truths in them. The, the I've often said that the most the more dangerous the doctrine is, the more truth it will have in it. Yeah, because you know it only it only takes a small amount of lies for the whole thing to be false, but. In any case, that's what we, it, 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 at the same time, if we take the truth, because they're, especially when it has to do with the end times, the end times are something that I will, or at least not yet, and I don't think that it'll ever happen in this lifetime, that you'll hear me get up and say, um, I know it all, I've got it all figured out, because um, I don't, and I don't think I will, but one thing that I do know is that there's not going to be a, a secret pre-trib rapture because it's just not taught in scripture, but also tied to that pre-trib rapture. Um, that's just one of the doctrines in dispensationalism. And it's funny. Um, we, I, I think we all, even if we can't think of one at the moment, this happened to me just this past week. Um, you know, I've been teaching against dispensationalism and its doctrines for several years now, uh, since late 2018, and yet I still found myself holding to a doctrine that was directly out of dispensationalism and it was a doctrine that really had only started being held by anyone in the church, um, you know, just a couple hundred years ago. And it was popularized by uh, Darby as well, too. Uh, yes, John yes, Nelson yes. Darby. Yeah. And uh, the subject that we are actually going to be talking about today is it comes from dispensationalism, but it, it also comes from Christian Zionism, but one thing that people don't understand is the author of confusion, which is what false doctrine is, confusion, is the devil. And so whether it's dispensationalism, full preterism, um, Postmillennialism, which is just uh, another term for dominionism, um, you know, all of these false teachings, they come from the same place. And of course, they start in the spiritual realm with the enemy and the fallen angels and his, the demons that are under his control, but they also are pushed by what we learn who are called the sons of disobedience in Ephesians, the people who are controlled, who allow themselves, whether knowingly or unknowingly, to push the lies of the enemy. And in the case of dispensationalism, 
and preterism both were actually pushed. Now, it doesn't mean they were necessarily started by the Jesuits, but they were pushed into the churches by the Jesuits. And if you know anything about Ignatius Loyola and the the history of the foundation of the the Order of Jesus, which is hilarious, the, the title, but the Jesuits were what a term that's that's known as crypto Jews for the origins anyway the founders and that sounds like a slang term but it's really not it just means secret they they were openly Catholic but in secret they still practiced um, you know Jewish mysticism and you know it, it's no secret to anybody that Babylonian mysticism, Jewish mysticism, uh, paganism is interwoven all through the Roman Catholic Church. And so it shouldn't be hard for anyone to imagine that factors of the Roman Catholic Church had a big hand in pushing these doctrines into the um, quote unquote Protestant churches and evangelical churches through places like Dallas Theological Seminary is the main university in the United States, but others just like it. And the seminaries taught the pastors, the pastors taught the congregations, and this was done through, you know, for centuries, at least two centuries. And here we are in 2023 having to have this conversation that in the first century, this would have never been an issue. Um, you know, as far as the majority of the church not understanding our role as the sons of God and sons and daughters of God and our mm -hmm. role as the elect and i'm not talking elect in you know a calvinistic way but a biblical way from the doctrine of christ you know paul calls us the elect we are called the elect israel in the old testament were the elect and that's what we are actually going to talk about today uh, brother jeremy and i talked last night and we started in the New Testament, and we looked at scriptures in the New Testament. Today, I actually want to start off in the Old Testament first to point out that in, say, Isaiah um, 53, for example, uh, the prophet Isaiah, also Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was prophesying about the new covenant that would be with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, all of the Old Testament prophets that were prophesying way back then, long before Christ ever came, they were prophesying the mystery of the gospel. The fulfillment of that mystery is the gospel. Jesus Christ is what all the prophets spoke about. And the revelation of that mystery is the new covenant changing of Israel in the sense that it transformed from the shadow you know Jesus talks about types and shadows and Israel in the Old Testament the nation whether it be the tribes of Israel the the that were wandering through the wilderness with Moses and Joshua and Caleb or if it's the people under King David or King Solomon the the split nations you know you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom you had walled cities and both kingdoms made up israel they were you know israel was interchangeable 
for most of history and especially for today when people say Israel they think of you know all of the tribes in the Old Testament but in the Old Testament it was prophesied over and over that Gentiles would enter into Israel in the new covenant. More than that, in the old covenant, Gentiles were able to enter into Israel then through the through circumcision, the keeping of the law, or if it was a woman through marriage, but Gentiles coming into the covenant relationship with God in Israel is not a New Testament, New Covenant phenomenon. It's something that is seen all throughout the Bible. And I think to start off, in order for people to truly understand the relationship between Old Covenant Israel and the new covenant church we first in order for anybody to understand the mystery itself or the revelation of the mystery that the apostles and all disciples of jesus christ are now able to understand we see this in all throughout paul's letters and in the Gospels, you know, Jesus opened up the minds of the disciples and they were able to understand the mystery that was prophesied by the prophets. But when they prophesied what God gave them to say, they still did not understand the mystery in which they were prophesying. You know, the, and it, it wasn't understood all throughout history either. This is why a lot of the Jewish people did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah because they didn't understand the mystery and they were looking for, you know, a physical king and a physical nation. And they still are to this day for the most part. And that's one of the big problems that we as Christians, when witnessing to um, those who are quote unquote Jews, physical Jews, that's one of the hurdles that we have to get over. However, um, the first thing we need to look at and understand is God's right to choose the way that he fulfills his sovereign promise. God has always had the prerogative and shown the prerogative all throughout history in the Old Testament, his prerogative to limit the blessings and limit who he used to fulfill, to fulfill his promises. Like, for instance, the promise was originally made to Abraham, right? Well, normally, the firstborn son would get the inheritance. So you would think that Abraham's firstborn son, Ishmael, would have been who God would have chosen to uh, fulfill the promise he made to Abraham to. And he did make a separate promise concerning Ishmael, and he fulfilled that promise. But God had chosen from the time he made the promise that he was going to fulfill it through Isaac, not through Ishmael, the firstborn, but through the seed of promise that came through Sarah and not Hagar. And although this is first seen in Genesis, we see it clearly portrayed in the New Testament in Galatians in chapter three, it goes back to the Old Testament and also um, in Romans. But first, God uh, used his sovereign right to choose how and who he used to fulfill his promise first in Isaac. And that's different. Isaac. I just, just want to say something real quick. 
that's we what we believe is different than how the Calvinists would use sovereignty. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I would. I, I do want to. I, I do yeah, want to put absolutely. that in there. Trust uh, me, I, I I was going to to point that out that, that this is not election, um, in the sense that Tulip and the Calvinists use it. You know, this is free will, but this is God's sovereign um, yes. choice of who He fulfills the the promises through and it's different in salvation exactly where calvinists conflate the two exactly and it's of course ultimately we'll see that it was god's prerogative to fulfill his promise through his son is where i'm getting to you know first it was changed from ishmael to isaac Isaac has twins, you know, he has Jacob and Esau. Esau was actually the firstborn, but he gave up his birthright. And which, uh, which, of, which, which in Malachi, you know, were the, were the Romans later on that Paul quotes from that the Calvinists use as uh, Jacob, whom I loved, Esau, whom I hated. Um, yes, but that's that, talking about, you know, the, 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 that's talking about Jacob uh, uh, representing the nation. Uh, 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 of Israel at the time, and Esau re representing the Gentile nations, and then hate doesn't necessarily mean that God hated them. It means, you know, pretty much a greater choice. And it actually, um, what Paul is showing is God's sovereignty to choose. Yes, and he he actually shows that, um, and in the New Testament. When he says, you know, Jake, Jacob, I have loved Esau, I have hated. Um, he's showing the, the seed of promise, ultimately being Jesus. He's showing, you know, Israel ultimately being fulfilled in the one seed. You know, it was originally uh, prophesied in Genesis 3, the seed of the woman that would come. And that is truly what the election was about in the Old Testament when God chose out of the nations um, Abraham to make his covenant with and ultimately chose a people for himself out of the nations. We need to understand what they were chosen for. And the Bible in the New Testament tells us as clear as can be what they were chosen for. Because that's what people get hung up on is that Paul says in Romans chapter nine, how, um, you know, they are and I'm paraphrasing, but that they are enemies for our sake, but um, or for the gospel, but loved for the election. And I'll pull it up in front of me in just a, in just a second. But it's actually. What Paul is pointing out that people get hung up on and what people have to stop getting hung up on is what Israel was chosen for. They were chosen to be who God brought salvation to the whole world through because Jesus Christ, they were elected for Jesus to be born out of the nation of Israel. They were also the nation that would have the or who, who would have the oracles and know the mysteries, Paul says. Yeah. You know, they 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 were chosen, they were special, they were elected, but that is not talking about dual covenants. You know, people who want to accuse People who hold to biblical theology about Israel and how that there's only one message from Genesis to Revelation, and that is Jesus. And as far as a kingdom goes, the kingdom of God is preached from all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yep. It, it It's always about faith. You know, when when. Paul talks about how Elijah was complaining to, to God, how, you know, um, they had killed the prophets and he alone was left. And, and God tells him, no, there is still a remnant that remains by faith. 
Yeah. It has always been by faith. God has never, you know, delighted in the blood of rams and bulls. And it's only been through faith that people have been able to be right with God and and the kingdom or Israel, you know, we see through I've got scripture after scripture that I uh, actually wrote down for us to look at. And if we look in Ephesians, I mean, we've got Colossians chapter one, we've got Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter two, Ephesians chapter three, Romans nine through 11. Um, Not, you know, in Romans nine, six through nine, Paul says that not all who are in Israel are Israel, but in Isaac shall the seed be. I don't have it in front of me, but I'm about to. But in Isaac, the seed shall be called. Um, And that is a reference to Christ and anyone who comes in through Christ, be they Jew or Gentile, male or female, is in Israel. Paul clearly tells us, and Jesus clearly told us, and it may be one of the best places to start, is Matthew 21, 43, where Jesus is uh, talking to the Jewish people. He's actually talking to the uh, um, religious leaders the scribes and the Pharisees, but they represent the non-believing Jews, any non-believing Jews. And he says that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people bearing the fruits of it. And the people he's talking about, some, some, um, Bible, uh, translations that say nation instead of people but the the people the nation the actual word there is ethnos and the ethnos that Jesus is talking about is people from all nations Jew by the flesh or Gentile by the flesh who have believed and chosen to follow Jesus Christ because you know we don't have you know, belief, salvation doesn't come through belief in the mind. It doesn't happen in the mind. Um, The biblical definition of faith always implies action. Even if you just are talking about repentance, that's an action, you know, um, to repent of your sins and you know, take up your cross and follow Christ is an action. Faith in the the biblical sense of the word is an action. But the thing that dispensationalists, especially mid-Acts dispensationalists, those who say that um, the Gospels and um, uh, Paul's letters except for, I can't remember which letters, but it it starts in mid-Acts, and there are a few letters that exclude James, Peter, anything not written by Paul is excluded. They, They say that those are written to the Jews, physical Jews, and it's Paul's letters that we are to follow. But the thing is, you can just take Romans and come up with the very same thing that Jesus yeah. taught in the Gospels. I mean, it's not different. The only difference is people are using the lens of dispensationalism and Christian Zionism to interpret Paul. And Paul is hard to understand, as Peter points out. But there are, li- I mean, the, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are littered with scriptures that prophesy a new covenant that would include all mankind, 
everyone would have the ability to be reconciled with God. And the scripture even tells us that it is the heavenly Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above that matters. It's not the patch of dirt in the Middle East that God is worried about. You know, a, a lot of people get hung up on the land itself because of dispensational end times theology. You asked a question earlier or made a statement earlier about are we living in the end times? And the, the answer is yes. The Bible says we've been living yeah. in the end times since the first century. That's true. And, you know, you know, it, it's just a matter of God's being slow to wrath, not wanting any to perish. But the scriptures are very clear that regardless to whether you are Jew or Gentile, you must be grafted into Israel to the olive tree, whether you were born a Jew and broken off because of unbelief in Christ, or you were born a Gentile and were never a part of the olive tree originally to begin with. Either way, you're not on the olive tree and you must be grafted into it. And the only way to be adopted, to be grafted in, is through Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, the people that I truly just don't understand are those who will agree with everything I just said and everything you have pointed out, but still say, yeah, but. Yeah, but they're, uh, the Israel of God is different than the nation of Israel. Well, um, yeah, I guess they are if you're talking about in, you know, who their bloodline is. You know, the, the Israel of God is also different than the Romans or the Chinese. But. God's election, not Calvinist election, but God's choosing a people for his name, as scripture says, is done for a reason. And we must look at what that reason is. In the Old Testament, the reason the people were chosen was to be a light to the nations, a light to the Gentiles, to be a nation of priests and kings. And now we're supposed to be a light unto the world. Exactly. Now we're supposed to be a light unto the whole world. And what does it say, though? The same thing that the Old Testament Israel was supposed to be, and that is a nation of priests and kings. The difference is we're now no longer a nation of priests after the order of Levi, but we're under the high priest, the high priest from the order of Melchizedek. And there is just too many New Testament scriptures that literally are just quoting Old Testament scriptures that show without a doubt that God has had one mission and one plan from before the foundation of the world. The mystery that we see fulfilled in Acts 13, 26, um, the gospel fulfilled is the mystery. The revelation of that mystery is Jesus Christ. You know, the majority of Israel rejected Jesus because they didn't understand the mystery, the mystery that was foretold by the prophets, that the prophets themselves did not understand while they were prophesying it. But we can see clearly in Scripture that Jesus opened the minds of, you know, his disciples and he revealed that there is no longer a physical nation of Israel, but that that people would be born into, but that there would be one body of Jesus Christ made up of Jews and Gentiles. And in Colossians 1.24, we see that Jesus' body is a church. 
you know, this mystery that is revealed to the saints includes all people in Christ. If they make the decision to believe on Christ and follow him, they must have faith and be obedient in following him. You know, Jesus says that we must die to ourselves daily, take up our cross and follow him. And, you know, that that mystery has now been revealed, not just in the apostles, the, the 12 apostles, but in all disciples of Christ. All nations can now enter Israel through Christ. And the thing that we need to understand in helping people to see this is who are the children of promise? You know, going back to the Old Testament, God had the prerogative to choose who he would fulfill the promise through. You know, he chose to fulfill it through, you know, uh, through Isaac rather than Ishmael. Then he chose to fulfill it through Jacob rather than Esau. And then in ultimately in the new covenant, he has used his ultimate authority and prerogative to choose once again to make his son, Jesus Christ, the heir and sovereign seed. He is the seed of promise. And, you know, whether people like it or not, it's God's prerogative to limit his blessings. And it was limited to Jesus, which opened it to all people in the new covenant when Jesus died and then rose again. You know, that is the mystery of the gospel. Yes, 100%. Uh, and I mean, you know, I, I don't see how people could not see that um, clear as day that now that they've had a um, progressive revelation, which is still going on because revelation in and of itself and the tribulation is still um, has not come to its full fruition yet. We're not living on the new heaven on the new earth uh that you know god has always what he's asked of people and what he's promised has never changed okay we were always saved by god's grace the grace that he shows us through our faith through our belief um and that's something you know some uh dispensationalists will say that during the quote-unquote age of the law that they went to paradise because they they kept god's law and it's like, no, it's because they believed and they had faith. And that's why they kept God's law. All right. Absolutely. And so, you know, the, those who didn't have faith didn't see the promised land. Right. I yeah. mean, they, they weren't allowed. Even Moses w wasn't allowed into the promised land. So I, I don't see how that, you know, that how that's not clear. I mean, we even see that, you know, like you said, and it was brilliantly put, you know, the apostles, you know, didn't even realize what when Jesus walked the earth. Uh, you know, fully that he was the Messiah. Uh, and it's the same um, as, um, you know, a lot of, you know, Jesus's family members um, and a lot of people that were around him during his earthly ministry. Um, and it wasn't until his death, burial, resurrection, it wasn't even till Pentecost uh, that they had fully realized, um, uh, uh, you know, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit of, of, of when the full revelation was given to them. Uh, 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 that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Um, and so, you know, we see um, the mystery being revealed throughout different, you know, we, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? So we have the full, you know, Bible, completed Bible in front of us. And we can look back and go, okay, so this part here was when another part was revealed. It's like a, it's like a picture, right? Or a puzzle, you know? So this part here, you know, God revealed it. This part here, God revealed it. And so, you know, and it still hasn't been completed yet, but I don't see how anybody can't see that what God has required of people, what God has promised, you know, those things are, you know, 
unchanging as far as God does not lie. Okay. When they, when the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it's the full nature of God, you know, what embodies God, who he is and the promises that he fulfills. God doesn't go back on his word. He never has and never will. And it's so funny though, that's actually what you just said is what people misunderstand and what dispensationalists and those who believe falsely about the old covenant Israel, what you yeah. just said is exactly what they use. They, they but the say thing is, God they don't, but the thing is they don't, don't understand it though. They don't get that's it. That's right. Is that they God doesn't it. lie is what it yeah. means. It's not that yeah. No, go ahead. I was going to say, but they, but they don't, they don't, they can't for some reason, they can't under, they also, I mean, it's to say with the Calvinists and the way they look at is God being ultimately sovereign, you know, being King Lord, which he is from that standpoint, but from their belief of ultimate sovereignty is that God doesn't have emotions. God is, is immovable, yeah. you know, and, 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 and so they look at it kind of like the same way in that regard too. Right. And it's not, when, 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 when Paul in Hebrews wrote, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it's the nature of God and yes. God's promises and what God fulfills. And people just don't understand that. Yep. And it's and clear as day the, to me. When you read the Bible, it's clear as day. It absolutely is. The, the promises, first of all, there were promises originally made to Abraham. And then there were promises made, you know, to the people at Sinai, the covenant that was signed at Sinai. But if you look at Sinai, you see a perfect picture of God's prerogative to change his covenant anytime he wants to and or change how he fulfills yes. his promises. But his promises and, he ne are never changed in that he's not a liar. Right. Absolutely. Um, but see, we tend to put our own um, stipulations on, or take away God's stipulations on those promises. In every instance, every single one, God put an if, he put the word if after the promise. And if the people didn't fulfill the if, then the promise would still be fulfilled, but they would not be a part of the fulfillment. You know, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, God was literally ready to wipe out all of them and fulfill his promise through Moses. He was going to start, you know, a new people. Through Moses, it would have still been fulfilling his promise to Abraham, and but it would have been his prerogative to fulfill it the way he wanted to. Of course, Moses um, spoke on behalf of the children of Israel, but there were still thousands who were killed. But if we look in Ephesians chapter 3, um, Paul says this. In talking about the the revelation of the mystery, um, Paul says, "For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles." So we know he's talking to Gentiles. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me. The mystery, as I wrote before to you in brief, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. And this is the important part, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Holy Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs 
of the promise and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power to me the very least of all saints this grace was given to preach to the gentiles the unfathomable riches of christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in god who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authority in heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose from the foundation of the world, which he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And you can keep reading through Ephesians 3 there, and he continues saying the same thing. He never changes, and it's actually one thought from Ephesians 1 on through. You know, you get to Ephesians 6, and then, of course, you have literally a parable from Paul of how to live the same way Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, you know, Ephesians 6, the whole armor of God is a lifestyle. And if you literally live the way Jesus teaches in Matthew 5 through 7, then you are also living the lifestyle Paul teaches in Ephesians 6. Yeah. But this is just one of many places where the mystery and the revelation of the mystery is talked about. And that mystery has always been, and even though it was just fulfilled in the new covenant, it has always been that Jesus Christ, the gospel, that Jesus Christ would open up the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven to mm -hmm. all people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ephesians 2, we see the very same thing. It is one of my favorite um, chapters to show people who believe that God is somehow that the election of physical Israel is a covenant in and of itself, that God chose them because they had special blood or something, um, you know, or that God is somehow all of a sudden a respecter of persons. But the thing is, they think that he's always been a respecter of persons. When the truth is that he chose they, Israel to represent him. Exactly. That's why he chose they, Israel. He chose exactly. them. And yes, they constantly disobeyed him. The remnant, there was always a remnant that did not. But they, but but in, in mass they constantly disobeyed him. And constantly they were being a harlot. Okay, and again, and and they, they survived off the promises made to their fathers. Yes, I I mean and, I just don't see I don't see how I I mean um, in closing I do got to go, brother. I'm sorry, but I I, I don't no, see how, I I don't see how like I you know I study dispensationalism to try to understand it. Um, and, you know, I studied like when I studied the different forms of eschatology, right? So I studied dispensationalism or um, covenant theology or uh, supersessionism is what they want to call Both it. Both are wrong, whatever. by the way. And so, yes. So they, you know, the labels that they put and everything, right. And the, the different labels that they put on. Um, and, 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 and I, I realized that there were, like you said, there are errors in all of what was presented. Um, and I just don't understand why people can't see that clearly. Uh, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, dispensationalism to me, it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make I any sense. It, 
Yeah, I mean, replacement theology, I, though, I have issues with. It does. I mean, it makes more sense. Well, it, it, both are man-made terms, and it's not that you know those who believe in uh, dual covenant theology like to use the term replacement theology for what I believe, but that is not even close to what yeah, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you know, it's just that it's not that the church has replaced a physical people it's that the promise that was made is now open to anyone yes. who will come through Christ you know but, the the kingdom of god has always been the mission has always been and has always been open you know, to those who will humble themselves and believe and have faith into the lord uh, but now we have the complete picture the complete fulfillment through christ which is why now if a believer dies they go to heaven compared to when a believer died before jesus christ they went to paradise um and and, and now we are able to enter the kingdom of god and we now are are, are um you know uh, more heirs to the to the to the promise um but those won't be completely fulfilled until you know uh the events of Rev the book of revelation play out and the new you know we're in our incorruptible bodies and uh, New Jerusalem, and, and 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 that's what'll be completely fulfilled uh, in the New Earth. Um, but I just don't see how just dispensationalism to me just leads to bad theology and to bad doctrine. And um, just as much as if you know um, the the basic term of super secessionism uh, that you know just the way that that it's put forth um, can lead people to amillennialism. And post millennialism too, uh, uh, so you know it's something that we have to be as Bereans and as you know um, watch women and watch men on the wall for Christ. We have to politely engage with believers of these types of false doctrines, uh, which are going to lead people astray into, I believe, the coming tribulation. Yeah, well, for myself. Um one thing that I used to be very dogmatic on is the end times. I'm no longer dogmatic on the end times other than uh, I have now stolen a saying from someone else. And that is that I reserve the right to admit I was wrong <laughs> 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 because I have been, you know, just completely convinced that I had something figured out only to see absolutely that I was wrong about it. So, you know, which God will show me, us. Yeah. I'm not dogmatic on the end times, except for on things that I believe are dangerous. Like, yes, I mean, preterism. I'm sure you would. Yeah. Full preterism, all millennialism, post-millennialism. Yeah. Yeah. Dispensationalism is, False, but I don't believe that it is dangerous, like say full preterism is yes. or dominionism. Yes. But I do I do have very deep prejudices for the doctrine of dispensational. Agreed, yes. Um, but not the people who who hold it. I just want yes. them to be set free from that bondage. Yes. Um Believe it or not, as much as I disagree with them, the people who come the closest to having the correct theology um, are the Hebrew roots people. Um, now, they take it too far, of course, um, in believing that that you must keep the, the old covenant law. But as, as far as if they just realize that we all have the ability to come into Israel, which they do, and that it's we do have a law that we have to follow the law of Christ. If if they saw that instead of you know the law of Moses, the Torah, yeah, mm -hmm. that, and, and that's why I say they come the closest to having it right, but they're still wrong, you know, it doesn't doesn't really matter how close you come if you're still believing. But I would argue that their world. doctrine leads more people astray than dispensationalism oh, yeah. like does. It, 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 well, you know, actually the two are, they, they don't like each other, 
but they believe a lot of the same things. Well, yes, but the Hebrew roots people I've seen, they tend to lead people, you know, people eventually yeah. deny Jesus. And that, from... that's the, that is the, the danger is, um, I guess I didn't make myself clear because there are, there are so many different facets of I gotta Hebrew go, brother. roots. Thank you for coming on with me. I love you. God bless you. I'll talk to you later. Well, Brother John had to go, so I'm going to hopefully be able to finish the recording on my own because I do have a couple more scriptures and points that I want to point out. I want to thank Brother John for coming on. I want to thank Brother Jeremy for coming on last night. And this is going to be one episode, of course, what Jeremy and I recorded last night and what John and I have recorded today. But I want to look really quick at... Um, just to prove that Israel is what was foretold, Israel is now open to all people if they would just accept and follow Jesus Christ, and that God no longer um, has a covenant with anyone based on the law of Moses, based on their um, genealogy. I just want to show the sheer amount of scriptures throughout the New Testament in the epistles. And I want to show how Romans 9 through 11 teach one clear thing and that you can't take because a lot of people like to take Romans 11 and see where Paul talks about the Jewish people being partially blinded um, but that their eyes would eventually be opened. And instead of trying to uh, quote it on my own, I'm just going to, I'm going to go to the scriptures myself right now. And before we go to Romans 11, I want to go to Romans chapter 16. Sorry, I'm using my Bible on my phone. Um, 16, let's, let's look here. Um, Paul says, now, according to him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. So again, we're looking at the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God has been made, made known to all the nations leading to obedience through faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. So we see that the mystery is now open to all people even though it was in times past kept secret. And we also see again in Romans chapter 9 through 11, which is what I want to look at here because it's literally one narrative all the way through. Romans chapter 9 says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. 
My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So Paul shows off the bat that he's talking about his kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants. So they are Israelites and what belongs to them, in other words, what they were elected for is the covenants, the old covenant, the giving of the law, the glory, and the temple service, and the promises who are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So Paul tells us in the beginning in Romans 9, what Israel was chosen for. They were chosen to have the covenants of the law, the giving of the law, the temple service, priests and kings, as we pointed out before, and who would ultimately be fulfilled in Christ. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise. Jesus is the seed of promise. Here's the important part that I want you to pay attention to. Uh, still in chapter 9, verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. So even though God made all these promises, made the covenants, and sent his son, just like Jesus said in Matthew 21, 43, it is not as though, Paul tells us here, it's not as though God has failed because they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's seed. But through Isaac, your seed will be called. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. It can't get much plainer than that. It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. But the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also. When she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For through the twins were not, for though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, God isn't saying here that he hates Esau, like, you know, despises him. He's talking about the fulfillment of his promises. He has chosen Jacob to fulfill the promise, not Esau. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? God forbid. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. 
and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Just as I was saying earlier, God has his sovereign right to choose who and how he fulfills his promises. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder. In other words, the clay will not say to the potter, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honor and another for common use. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand For glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. Just as he foretold in Hosea. See, way back in the Old Testament, this is the mystery. The prophets foretold it, although they did not understand how it would be fulfilled. In Hosea, God said, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And it shall be in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there They shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant it is that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, Unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us to a posterity, he would have become like we, or excuse me, we would have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? But Israel, who was pursuing a law of righteousness, did not attain that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but they did so as though it were by their own works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Who is the stumbling stone? Jesus Christ. And last night with Brother Jeremy, we read the scripture where Jesus talks about being the stumbling block. But it says here, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling block and a rock of offense. And 
He who believes in him will not be disappointed. And in Romans chapter 10, I'm going to sum it up for you and ask you to read it on your own because we have to close out this episode. But it's about the word of faith bringing salvation. It is faith that brings salvation. And in chapter 11, we see that Israel has not been cast away. No, because a remnant remains. So instead of being cast away, God chose to fulfill his promise. And the revelation of the mystery of that promise is that Israel is now opened up to all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, and therefore all Israel will be saved when the fullness of the Gentiles come in to Israel. Then all Israel will be saved. Not all Israelites of the flesh who have ever lived or who are alive, But when the fullness of the believing Gentiles join the fullness of the believing Jews of the flesh, those together make up all Israel. And when they come together, it is then that all Israel will be saved. So remember that, and I love you guys. I thank you for joining us on this edition of the Remnant Report. Until next time for Kingdom Productions and Publishing and the Kingdom Productions Network, I am Pastor Jeremy Anderson, the Remnant Warrior, saying good night, grace, and peace.